Okay, my name is Dr. Boucher and I'll be moderating tonight's session. So welcome to the AAM Young Physicians Section Advocacy Webinar Series. Uh, tonight's program will be recorded and uploaded to the website within the next 24 hours or so. This is meant to be interactive. So if you have a question, raise your hand, type it in the chat. Otherwise, let us know that you're interested and we are uh, welcome and encouraging participation. So tonight I have the privilege to introduce you to our panelists. We have two today that will be taking place in this webinar. Uh, the first one is Debbie Fletcher. She is a community physician at Overton Brooks VA Medical Center, part-time, uh, also the full-time mom of a teenager and she loves doing medical missions in Belize. And we have Julie Veith, who is the medical director of the Canton Potsdam Hospital Emergency Department in upstate New York, the chair of the Workforce Committee, uh, as well as a former Scientific Assembly co-chair and speaker. So tonight's topic is about advocacy. Uh, it is what we can do and what advice do we have. So before we get started, do either of the two of you have a key point that you want to mention tonight as something to be a take home message? So I think at the end of the day, the key home message for all of us needs to be being inactive in this realm is not an option anymore. <laughs> Debbie, I think you're on mute. Yes, sorry. I agree with Julie. We have to get involved. The days that doctors could just get by on not doing anything politically is gone if we want to make a difference. Debbie, I'm actually going to piggyback on that. Um, why don't physicians get more involved politically? Um, it just traditionally doctors have been able to work, do their job, and go home and you were rewarded based on patient outcomes, patient gratefulness. Um, but with the corporatization of medicine and doctors having less autonomy, you know, that has changed and we do need to get involved. But before doctors never really saw a need because things went our way and patients were being well taken care of. At this point, also, doctors really kind of see the political world as kind of a dirty, seedy kind of area that they don't want to be involved in at all. And that's probably true to some degree. Um, we just have to be in it to be at the table. Do politicians really want to hear from us? And what do they want to hear? I, they do want to hear from us. Um, in fact, our state medical society, they've been interested in having um, physician involvement because right now there are no physicians in the legislature at all. We have one nurse practitioner, a chiropractor and a pharmacist. Otherwise there are no other medical professionals. So when these bills, anything related to patients, physicians, scope of practice, they, they really don't know. So they're interested in finding out. A lot of them have their own opinion already and they really, don't want to listen, but there are many that want to be open-minded to find out. Uh, some of them that I've met uh, were really big uh, recently on the surprise billing, but think about it, surprise billing, the patients reached out to their legislators and they are the ones who got this effectiveness changed. So, so sorry. <laughs> Gerald! So, Debbie, I'm going to um, piggyback off of what's Debbie, if you want to go on mute. Yes, um, I think I will. <laughs> so um, I'll piggyback off what Debbie was saying, too, about uh, why physicians haven't traditionally wanted to be involved. And I think that's, you know, she certainly spoke to the idea that uh, we didn't have to be right. So many times, especially in primary care, um, we were uh, in private practices where people could sort of do their own thing. Certainly emergency medicine hasn't really been in that way. The other thing is that we're not taught any of this in medical school, right, or in residency. Advocacy sort of comes along later and only if you really wanna be involved in it. It seems like this really foreign world. 
And we're so used to being experts in our own field. We don't feel like we can be experts in advocacy, um, except we can be, we absolutely can be, especially on these bills that really affect healthcare. So how, Debbie, how do we start this process? So how do we make a connection with one of our, one of our own politicians? Um, first of all, uh, see if you have any friends that know them. You can use them to make a connection. Um, you can stalk their Facebook page um, and see what they like, what they are interested in, and find something similar that you can talk to them about other than medicine first. Um, I've uh, called and talked to their legislative assistant last year when we were working on our scope bills and getting my foot in the door with one of the legislative assistants, she was able to provide me tons of information and kind of background things about the, the process and get me into meetings easier with my legislator. So all of that you can do on your own. And they really do look for other opinions because you are a voter. And how do you reach out initially? How do you make that first step yeah, how do you get that first foot in the door? It, it was scary last year when we were fighting our scope and it was starting cold calls. We got the list of all of the senators and representatives and started with the ones locally and the ones that we knew supported our cause. And that was easier to start making the calls for that. And then after that, I mean, we were pretty aggressive with our group and started making calls across the state. Even if they said no, it was practicing the speech, doing your elevator speech. You needed to have your points that you wanted them to hear well honed. And over the course of a couple of days, you pretty you got pretty good at it. And you realized you are the expert on this. They have no idea. And it it was it it helps build your confidence that this this is what you know about. And what sort of information did they want to hear about these, you know, the issues that we've had that you've discussed with them? Mm -hmm. uh, for scope of practice, they were interested in how the main thing our, our guys were, were access. They didn't really care about education and you would think that they would, but their whole goal was to improve access and the nurse practitioner side had convinced them that this bill for independent practice did improve access. We had to explain to them that that wasn't how it worked and it did not improve access. In fact, it would create a, a somewhat racist system where you'd have a two-tier society. People that were rural or already marginalized um, would it be okay to say they had lower care. And those were things they had never even thought about. The other things that we're trying to tell them that they, they don't look at how um, studies are done to see if it's a good study or if it's not a good study. So they're being given studies by the nurse practitioners that say that they're just as good, but we were explaining to them that most of those don't have good data, they're self-referring studies. So trying to get them to understand where what that side is coming from. Sure, sure. Um, to pivot a little bit, Julie, why is this topic in terms of patient safety and, and uh, you know, physician-led care, why is this topic important? Why should we care? Well, we're all patients at one point or another. <laughs> Um, and, you know, a lot of people look at this who are non-physicians as a turf war, um, as, as money and that we're money hungry and we just want to protect our paychecks. And um, don't get me wrong, I like having a solid paycheck. <laughs> I think we all do after, you know, paying off our, our medical student debt. But, um, but really, at the end of the day, our, our patients need our expertise. And this subpar education and replacement of physicians with subpar, um, less educated individuals is not acceptable. We would never accept that in other areas of society. And why we have now, um, why we're now being told that we're all equals and that there's no hierarchy is 
it's a scam uh, for one thing. Um, it's driven by corporate, the corporate side of medicine, because it sure is a lot cheaper um, at the outset to hire someone with lesser training, but it harms patients when patients don't know who they're seeing. And um, it's very clear that all of these studies that say, oh, um, you know, nurse practitioners can, can have equal outcomes. None of those studies were actually done in, in a great way. And many of them, if not all of them, were done with physician-led care. And so we're extrapolating poor science to say that it's equal. And, um, you know, I think there's a role for NPs and PAs when we're specifically talking scope of practice, but it can't be, um, a, you know, as an equitable role. What has been the reaction when you do explain to people, you know, that the that these studies are flawed or at least that their outcomes are being, you know, manipulated? Like how, how have lawmakers or how have other people responded when you've come up with that? I think as Debbie said, you know, most of these people that we're sharing these studies to are not scientists, right? So they're not really used to reading these types of papers. So they're, they're listening to the first sentence that someone gives them. If I hand them a I could hand them a blank piece of paper and say, look, this is blue and it says X, Y, and Z. And if there's nobody there to argue that, then that's probably what they're gonna believe if it looks like at first glance, that seems to be correct. Um, and of course we can dig into those and say, no, 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 that's not at all exactly how this study was done or, or what this says. I think people in general, they, they hate to be, um, they don't like things swept under the rug. So if it feels like that someone is taking advantage of them by um, not presenting accurate information, I, I think that's a huge negative when people do that. And I think in general, they are glad to be educated, right? Of, of educating, but not being um, over the top and condescending when we, when we do educate. Debbie, what's your experience been? And same, and just to think about like on, on a side note, so one of the new bills for Louisiana that they're suggesting is for the NB, in, NP independent practice is to go ahead and pass it and then study it for three years and see what the problems were, what the complaints were, and then go from there. And I was explaining to my state representative just yesterday how this is not how the right way to do a medical study. You don't pass it and then figure it out later, kind of like all of their problems with the vaccines. You don't say, okay, this is what we're gonna do and then study it, you need to study it first. And then I also was explaining to them that this is the patient involved here and the patient, they need to have some informed consent that they're being studied. They need to know that this is an option for them and that they can opt out. So that was something that they had not considered either. These are things he said, well, that's why we need a physician in the legislature so you could explain this to them. They don't realize that these are, a, that's a poor way to do a study. What was the outcome of that, uh, that conversation? Uh, he, he definitely agreed. And so he would tell people when he went, because he was leaving for Baton Rouge the next day, but and I mean, this is a fight that just started for us coming this week. So we'll hopefully continue to use that as, as our defense. Um, Julie, how can we get involved in these issues? I think it's really important for people to get involved in their state medical society. Uh, that's where um, the state level of legislatures actually listen to what's happening in the state. And like it or not, um, you know, the, the state medical societies are linked to AMA generally, but they are independent in a lot of capacity. Certainly they can request money from the AMA for, to support uh, different, um, different missions. But, um, but if you don't get involved in your state medical society, it's really hard to have the backing of another group to go after a certain bill. The other thing is that state medical societies pay professional lobbyists to do a lot of this work. And um, that's how things happen, right? In these back hallways with random conversations and cold calling people and, hey, I know Billy and she knows John and I heard this and they heard that. And, and getting access is all through, through the state medical society. That's where 
um, at least in New York, that's how things have happened. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Um, in New Jersey, our state medical society is relatively powerful and connected in the legislature. So we've also been able to successfully uh, fight off many bills. And I'm not an AMA member, but I am a member of my state medical society, which I think is a, a good way to get involved in these issues. Um, I'd like to mention that too. I remember when I started doing AAM workforce a few years ago, that was one thing Julie kept saying, get involved in your state medical society. And that is so true. That's where the scope of practice bills are all done at the state level, not the federal level. So to have a say so in that is very important. And the sadly for us, for our state medical society in Louisiana is not as strong as like New Jersey. I'm a bit jealous with that. And so a group of us started a side group, uh, Louisiana Physicians for Patients, to try to help improve the, uh, the lobbying efforts. So we've hired our own legislate, I mean, our own lobbyist. We were told last year regarding the lobbyist, he one told uh, one of the members that you guys are doctors are too nice. You need a lobbyist to actually get in there and convince them. And let me guess, they were relatively cheap. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was successful. So. Yeah. So um, I want to open this up to, if anybody has questions, comments, their own experiences with this, uh, my two cents are essentially, you know, our legislators are people um, and we have plenty of experience talking to and analyzing people. And, you know, just like we have, you know, interests, they do too. And so the easiest way to get involved on your own is to just simply reach out uh, if you, you know, to your local representative, your local state senator, uh, because they are representing you, your constituent, and they represent you. So they'll listen to what you have to say at the minimum. Um, with that said, I'd like to open this up to anybody else who has questions, comments, or Debbie and Julie, if you have little tidbits you want to share that, that I didn't specifically prompt or ask about. Okay, I noticed uh, Jamie Quo's on the call, and she was one of the um, main leaders in getting the lobbyists last year. So I'm, I would like for see if she would say something. Yeah, I, thank, thank you, Debbie. I was going to uh, say something because I wanted to just really echo what you said about, um, you know, talking to my own rep and like really getting down to like a like, a, like microscopic level with them about um, the, the problems and something that I did today was um i think i don't know if you um got my text message but i it was i had a very successful meeting with my representative today and what i did to her was i feel like every year in the legislation it's a lot of arguing and a lot of accusations so when i got on the phone with her i actually and and this was this is louisiana physicians for patients this is our uh this is what we want to focus on we want to focus on patient care right it's about the patient it's not about the nurse practitioner it's not about the physician, it's about the patient. So I offered my representative a lot of the solutions and rather than an argument, I offered her solutions and she totally jumped on it and totally built upon it and got really excited. And by the end of the conversation, she said, Jamie, you need to tell all your doctors to do what with their, legisla with their legislators, what you just did with me. She was like, I'm so glad that we talked today. And I was like, yes, you know, I can feel good today because, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster dealing, dealing mm -hmm. with people's opinions. Yeah. But what did you tell her that was positive that she seemed to resonate with her? So, you know, we're always saying, oh, we, we, every year I find everyone's always focused about, oh, they only do 500 hours or, you know, no one cares about that. Right. Like we, we it's become pretty obvious that they don't care about that because the, these laws keep passing. So I said, you know, I said, I compare the NPs to the PAs. Like we, when I speak to my PAs that I work with, when I speak to my NPs that I work with, the vast majority of them do not want independent practice. So we sit there and we kind of mourn the days where we had a true team approach versus our big hospital system separating us in the ER, them going to the fast track, you know, me going to the main side. 
And we sit there and we talk about how much greater it was, how much better quality of care was when we worked together. So I was telling her, you know, the one of the bills that we have is with uh, like the PAs, they want to switch uh, in Louisiana. They want to switch from uh, supervisory roles to collaborative practice. I think they, the argument is that it makes them more marketable and it gets rid of some paperwork. I'm not, I don't really understand it yet. I said, but you know, the NP, the PAs that I talked to, they don't want that. They want the supervision. That's why they went to PA school. I said, so the, so then, you know, the nurse practitioners, we need to do the same thing because they're already at the collaborative issue. We need more supervision. And I brought up the Mississippi, the Hattiesburg clinic study, how co-management actually proved to be the best quality, actually gave best quality uh, whenever they measured it. I said, so if anything, we need to strengthen it. And so what I threw out to her was um, how the, the gumbo act that was just passed that, you know, Dr. Bollinger told us about. Um, basically it is uh, the, and then the infrastructure act. So basically there's a lot of rural areas in Louisiana that don't even have Wi-Fi. And like, you know, here we are in our big cities, you know, going, oh, my fiber isn't fast enough, right? We're like, and we don't even realize that some of these rural areas have no Wi-Fi at all, you know? So we just passed the, you know, we just started getting the infrastructure bill that should be implemented. And then the telehealth just got passed in Louisiana. I said, why don't they, if some of these nurses that are saying that they can't find a physician collaborator, they can use the telehealth option versus saying, well, I can't find a collaborator, so give me independent practice. What we can say is, okay, if you can't find an, a collaborator, we will give you one through telehealth. So she started building on that and saying, well, you know what, maybe we could get the nursing board to uh, employ, you know, and this was just an idea, to, to, get, to get physicians to agree to do contract work, and then we limit so that there's no abuse, right? There's not these like mailbox money doctors. She was like, we can limit the amount of nurses that they oversee, and then they can be there to see the patients face to face. And I was able to give her all kinds of examples. Have we already do that in the ER, like with psychiatry, right? I've done plenty of psychiatry consults, stroke, right? We get the, the neurostroke people. How, help, how helpful is that? And uh, we even did a pilot study at one of the hospitals I've worked with the pediatrics, and that was super helpful. We didn't use them very often, but it was the little that we did, did help. So she totally jumped on that solution, the telehealth and the, uh, the Wi-Fi capabilities that should be coming available in Louisiana and said, we need to grow on that. So the focus became more fixing the problem, giving a solution versus just arguing and saying doctors are greedy, nurse practitioners don't have enough education because those arguments get old, you know? Yeah, that's an excellent point, um, bringing up actually proposing solutions to some of these issues. Um, there's a couple of comments in the chat I want to mention. So Mitch Lee uh, posted about HCA and funding and not being able to speak because it's being tied, you know, you're, you're, you're tied to funding from these organizations, basically big corporations, and how do we get around all the money and power that big corporations have? Mitch, that's a great comment. How do we get around all the uh, money and power corporations have? Because I do not have an answer for you. Can I add something to that that might make it a little more clear for all Absolutely. Of the question is, so, I mean, I can go, it sounds like, and probably it's worth it that I can go, of course, on behalf of, behalf of Take My and Back or just myself and try to find a, um, a congressperson, but I wouldn't be part of a larger voice if I'm not going with a medical society or AAEM or et cetera. And so the medical society in Western North Carolina most of the docs are there and really hate what HCA has done. There's been a mass physician physician exodus from the area, to be honest, um, and it's really harmed access for people. But because there's been no Medicaid expansion expansion in North Carolina, um, they're very very dependent for vulnerable populations on what's called Project Access, which was funded by the hospital before it was bought out by HCA. And in order to keep that funding. Um, and keep that program going, uh, they basically had to shake hands with devil and say, well, we're not going to criticize HCA. Um, so there's been work behind the scenes, but it's that money that's, you know, they have them by the throat. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to go to a white coat Wednesday, like a, a lobbying day. But, you know, most of what's on the bill, there's a little bit of scope creep on the bill or on the docket to talk about. 
Um, and then there's things like, you know, the uh, naloxone, a naloxone bill and a needle exchange bill and stuff that's important, but really has nothing to do with like this, this root cause issue. Um, and I'm wondering if I should just like use those connections once I meet them to then reach out on behalf of myself um, to speak what I'm really thinking, because otherwise we're kind of muzzled. Julie or Debbie, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, have you, I'm sure you have done this, but have you started internally with the Medical Society um, proposing changes to your bylaws or um, however it's framed in your medical society to say, this is a huge conflict of interest and we need to separate this. That's certainly, you know, that, but that takes a full year and people to get on board with that in the medical society. And it sounds like there's a lot of conflicting um, pressures there, but I would absolutely use the medical society to get your contacts and then use those relationships uh, as a sideline once you're connected because um, that is a huge conflict, right? And, and you of all people know this best. Um, and if you can't separate that, then of course, all of everything that the medical society does is going to be in conflict for what actually needs to be done, which is all of this corporate stuff to, to go away and, and, and us to really be clear on um, that medicine cannot, should not and cannot be corporatized. So I would use those connections. Debbie, I'm curious what yeah, you do. Same. And one of the things I've noticed that seems like we've all been talking about, we need to get the public involved because the public response to that can overthrow some of these things that are being done shadily. Um, kind of like how dope sick started and more people started complaining about you know, opioid epidemic and, and then they were able to overturn a lot of the big pharma stuff. It's kind of how I feel with scope and all of these corporate practice of medicine uh, problems. It's going to take a lot of us saying stuff and we can do as much as we can, but until the public actually gets involved with it and starts complaining that they paid the same amount to see a nurse practitioner or they were not able to get something resolved, then that that's something we can help do. And I know Mitch, you have some connections um, with journalists and things like that. If we could work on, on getting more public awareness and public relations campaigns. I'd also be really curious um, to see what the AMA mothership thought of this relationship between HCA and this particular uh, fraction of the medical society. I feel like they might have something to say about that, but I guess, you know, I'm sort of just very peripherally a member mostly to get access to their maps and things. Um, but I would be curious to see how they interpreted that. Um, Cher had asked, what can we do to make more physicians involved, especially specialists? We need money for lobbyists. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, a lot, I mean, I can't, I'll, I'll let you guys answer also, but for me to, for myself to get involved, it was just knowledge of this issue. I think that there's still a, you know, this year and last year with the, the ASEP uh, workforce prediction really kind of brought the issue to the forefront of most emergency physicians that weren't aware of these issues beforehand. Um, but I think just awareness of this issue has gotten people involved because as people become more aware of this, we've had people reach out to the workforce committee to get involved. And we've seen more and more things that people are writing like in EM News and some of the other organizations and on social media. So just awareness itself has gotten people involved in that. Um, Debbie, Julie, you have any thoughts? I think um, after April of last year when the big workforce study from ASAP came out, I think finally people started understanding that this was a huge deal and it wasn't going away and more people had to get involved. And that's been great. And I think a lot of people are doing things from different angles, which I also think is really, really useful um, because it takes all of these different angles to actually implement change. Um, I've been really surprised at how many people just in my own work environment 
have mentioned something about workforce based on reading EM news or you know what we call the, the throwaway journals um, and just those articles being out there and making it more making it easier for people to talk about this for a long time it was hush hush and if you talk about this then you're anti this or anti that um and this is it's not just our future but our personal futures right in emergency medicine but emergency medicine as a whole and if you can even relate it to other specialties for example dermatology anesthesia then you also get more backing um, when you're going to talk to legislators. Like this is not just an emergency medicine issue. This affects X, Y, and Z. This is why it affects patients. Um, so I think those, all those, all everything that's happened in the last year has been really beneficial. Um, you know, in terms of how you get more physicians involved. Um, I mean, we at my at my shop we started. Um, like a women's physician dinner group. And this comes up every time we go to dinner. And of course, dinner has not been as frequent with COVID, but um, inevitably it comes up every time and it starts small and then it gets bigger. And you also have a lot of power to change at the local level. And I mean, microcosm level. So if you can get on committees of your own hospital, um, if you're a chair, director of a department and you get to sit on your med exec committee or credentialing committee, you actually have a lot of impact into what happens just at your own microcosm level. And that also can be very, very helpful. And it gets more people talking and it gets more people involved. We just faced um, a challenging conversation at my hospital with med exec. And I was really surprised when I talked to other chairs um, that they were on the same page as me. And yet we had not really openly talked about it. Um, and I was floored and very pleasantly surprised that I didn't have to be the only person shouting from the rooftops about the scope of practice. So I think people are ready to talk and they want to talk. They just haven't had a good avenue to do that in and felt like they're not protected. Yeah, I think protection is kind of a big issue with these, with, is a big issue with these issues. Um, especially given the stigma about, you know, upsetting other people's feelings who are, when you talk about especially scope of practice, um, and I want to put a plug in there for unionization, if that is an option where you work, um, I think that it is an underrated aspect of physician employment, and most physicians would never even think twice about the benefit of a union uh, but um, I was anti-union, or I just didn't think there was a role for unions in anywhere until I realized how terrible employers are, um, and no employer is immune to being terrible. So uh, I think there's certainly some value there for this kind of stuff. I just wanted to say um, one thing, and I know I'm, I know I'm not one of the um, people on the roundtable, but just talking to share, you know, share asked the question of how do we get other specialists, you know, to get involved and like get money. So last year, and this is actually how I met Debbie, because she was one of the people that ended up donating to my calls. But last year I befriended a plastic surgeon in town and um, she like literally our, our relationship just grew like exponentially every day. And by Thursday night, she called me and said, Hey, we're going to hire lobbyists. You know, um, do you want to like put in some money or do you want to do that? I said, and the lobbyist was going to be $50,000. I said, how much money did you, how much money did you, uh, did, did you uh, raise so far? And she said, $25,000. I said, okay, don't do anything else. I'm off tomorrow. I'm going to raise the other $25,000 tomorrow. And what I did was I got up the next morning and she had already done this. I got up the next morning and just cold called every single friend I had on my phone list and said, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what's going on. This is dangerous. I said, you know, this is why you should care. We need money. And honestly, most people already do care. They're just kind of sleepy, right? They're just kind of not paying attention as much as people like Debbie and I are. So Debbie ended up being one of the people that donated. Of course, I donated money. And um, um, one of our state societies um, that will remain unnamed, um, I called them, they put together an executive board meeting and they approved a certain amount of money. And so they donated money to our cause. And we, within 24 hours, we raised $50,000. And it was all physicians from all over the state. And it was not just ER people. It was surgeons, you know, primary care doctors, psychiatrists. It was everyone because truly everyone's affected, right? 
we just have to remind them of that. And that's so what I, I did this year. We're, go ahead, Debbie, sorry. No, it's summer. So I'm actually the one that was, that, that raised the other 25,000 and we raised it, like she said, in 24 hours. I had a GI in oncology, um, a neurosurgeon from North Louisiana, a nur my husband who's a neurosurgeon. We had um, probably 15 plastic surgeons and uh, we raised it, like she said, in 24 hours. At, honestly, every single person we asked gave money. At most people gave the, we had a couple people that gave like $3,000. Um, most people though gave between 500 and 2000 and not, not begging them, just told them the issues. They had heard about it before they wanted, you know, and this was after it had gone through the bill had uh, gone through the committee in the house. It had passed the house. It had gone through committee in the Senate and it was going to be voted on, on the floor of the Senate. And if it passed that, then it would go to the governor's desk. And so we stopped it after the Senate committee. And at that point, the nurse practitioners thought they had it signed, sealed, delivered. And we got this together, like she said, 24 hours, we had raised $50,000. One week later, he had they had it killed before it went to vote. How did you approach it's amazing. the, yeah, that's amazing. How did you approach the GYN oncologist and the neurosurgeons who one might think aren't as exposed to these sort of scope issues as we are? So the GYN oncologist actually is was very exposed to scope issues, not because she was afraid of her own practice or felt like they were encroaching upon her personal practice, but she actually had mid-levels participating in her service because apparently um, with the GYN oncology, you know, let's say you have cervical cancer, then you get whatever your surgery is. Then you have to do screening uh, pap smears every six months. They have a protocol for how frequently you do it. Um, but obviously she can't do all of that follow-up screening. And so she has mid-levels doing those, you know, surveillance uh, uh, pap smears and, and office visits. She originally had, I want to say, two or three mid-levels doing that. She got rid of all of them and hired, I want to say, two regular OBGYNs who know who were kind of like maybe in their late 50s that weren't ready to retire but didn't want to deliver babies anymore. And she said, I'm getting rid of the mid-levels and hiring GYNs, I mean, you know, OBGYNs. And so she said, like, she got it. She was totally on board. And then her friend was the neurosurgeon and she was on board too. Like people, people, once you talk to them and like a lot of you guys have mentioned, they've heard about it. They just really hadn't had an avenue to like participate. And so they jumped right on board. That's excellent. It, it's funny. I was, um, every time I work with a resident now, um, I corner them and I'm like, Hey, donate money to our <laughs> like you need to get on board you need to wake up you need to fight. yeah and that's a whole nother conversation about residents and how to protect them um from all of this and being labeled as non-team players etc but mercy i would love to hear um from you if you don't mind about everything that you have been doing and the success that you've had in in your group just to give other people ideas of what can be done Hi everybody, I've been quiet and I, and literally <laughs> figuratively, I've been quiet on the national front with AAM for some time because we've been very busy at our state level. My state is Indiana. And um, as has been mentioned before, many scope issues happen at the state level. Most happen at the state level. Um, we have a seasonal legislature, so we, we just finished our legislative session last week. It started the first week of January. So it was a short session. So they cram a lot of stuff into two and a half months, basically. Um, so it was pretty much go, go, go for the last two and a half months. Um, so I know I've kind of fallen off of the radar. Um, 
but uh, I mean, there's been so much great stuff said. I think, I mean, Louisiana, we need to learn from you <laughs> how to fundraise for sure. Um, I mean, those are some great ideas there. I, I do think that one-on-one -on -one, um, connections with other physicians is really uh, an excellent idea. And um, so, yeah, we need to do more of that. Um, some other things that we've been doing in Indiana, we did not have a um, an FPA build this season uh, to fight. We are expecting one next season. The things that we did this year, um, we had a truth and transparency in practitioner uh, identification and advertising bill, um, which kind of got amended to take this and that out and then put this and that back in over the course of the session. That was probably our primary bill that we worked on. Um, and uh, there were some other bills also, which were unfortunately not as successful. There was a um, non-compete bill, physician employment non-compete bill, um, which we were trying, we were advocating for and that, uh, that failed. Um, we also had a, a scope bill, limiting scope of nurse practitioners um, and uh, kind of tightening some of the oversight uh, putting actual limits on the number of um, NPs that could be under a single physician license, making sure that the physician, um, uh, not licensed, but expertise matched with the area of um, practice that the NP worked in, because we had all these cases of like pathologists, you know, collaborating with um, med spa NPs. Um, but unfortunately, that bill did not um, did not move forward. So we learned a lot. Um, uh, as Louisiana did, we also hired a um, hired a lobbyist. So when I say we, uh, we started a PPP Indiana, which was kind of a loose uh, association of physicians. Uh, of all specialties in Indiana that had just organized on social media. But we uh, formed an official 501c4, uh, which is a type of nonprofit that allows lobbying. Um, so we, we formed that officially in November and filled out all the paperwork and all of that and got it up and running, which was really kind of late, which, you know, so we did hire lobbyists in November, but at that point it was, it was difficult to get a bill together and find um, sponsors in the legislature. We did it, but it was very, you know, like it was not uh, done as well as we could have done it. And so we learned a lot about it. Uh, we also learned that we didn't like our lobbyists and that not all lobbyists are uh, made the same. And the guy that we hired was fairly expensive. He had a very, he was very well recognized. He was a person who um, had uh, been a US congressman from our state and had run for US Senate and lost in that race to our current, one of our current senators. So he had, he had a lot of name recognition and had a lot of connections behind the scene, which is why we hired him. But we found that we wanted a level of um, commitment and communication that he was not used to. Uh, I, I think like, you know, we wanted to have at least, you know, a in-depth conversation with him at least once a week and to know what's going on. And he was sort of, um, pawning off a lot of those things to his underlings <laughs> and we so we just kind of felt like his underlings were doing some of the work but I don't think we'll be going back with him uh, in the future so we we learned a lot from this process uh, I think that having a lobbyist was absolutely essential all of the uh, ins and outs of getting bills passed or killed um, we I mean we learned a lot from them and just the procedure of when to show up, how to sign up to testify, uh, what to say, what not to say. Um, it was just really invaluable. Um, so that was one thing. And now that our session is over, um, something else that was mentioned briefly is that um, 
we are really kind of taking the angle of representing um, patient safety matters when patients intersect with corporate healthcare. So, you know, there's lots of patient safety issues, but we're kind of tackling or speaking for the patient safety issues um, that uh, happen when patients intersect with corporate healthcare. So that includes um, NPP scope, um, the truth and the truth in advertising stuff. Uh, we felt very much so was a safety issue, and that's how we presented it. Um, but also some things like um, bedside nursing uh, to patient ratios, which we feel like is very much a patient safety issue. And so we're by kind of branching out to things outside of the scope um, arguments, we're hoping to make some more allies. Um, we did actually testify in favor of a couple of nursing bills. There was a nursing bill that had um, that was increasing, basically uh, increasing the number of people that were able to get an associate's degree RN um, by by changing the the way their ed, the RN educators requirements were or something. So we actually testified in favor of that because we want more you know associate degree RNs that will stay at the bedside. So. We made some friends actually like that, and we're hoping to continue doing that. It, right now in the off season, we're um, having lots of meetings with other patient advocacy groups um, that all have their own uh, kind of focused mission, but there are some things that we can, um, that we overlap with our missions. Um, so like tomorrow I'm meeting with somebody from something called the Indiana Health Fund, and it's a nonprofit that works on um, educating patients about medical debt, how to avoid getting into medical debt, and then once you have medical debt, how you can um, pay it off and get out and you know like get it off of your credit. So we have a meeting with them. We have, I mean, pretty much every week I have one or two of these meetings where we're trying to make alliances. So uh, in that way, we're trying to. Uh, spread our um, influence um, and be able to reach more patients because there are way more patients in our state than there are physicians. Um, so we need patients to also start calling their legislature uh, legislators and um, you know uh, telling them because we we fully anticipate an FPA bill next uh, January. So that's kind of an update from Indiana. Mercy, thank you for all of that. Um, we are starting to get to the end of our time. So why don't we, I'm gonna say, let's thank our panelists, uh, Debbie Fletcher and Julie Veith for sharing with us tonight. And thank you everybody for attending the session. Um, just to keep some, some housekeeping. Um, there will be an advocacy day at Scientific Assembly this year on April 28th in Baltimore. Um, so if you are going to be there, uh, don't forget to register for that if you are interested. Um, and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or wanna to talk to us afterwards, uh, you can reach out to us through the AAM website. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thanks. To Thanks to everybody who also shared their stories and, and successes this past year. I think we can all learn from each other. Yeah, I think discussing things that have worked has been helpful for all of us. Yep, thank you guys. Good night. Good night. <laughs>